getting wrecked is a good lesson. But it's look. a good lesson. It was my best lesson. But everybody else there if will tell you the same stuff. They'll go, dollar cost average. Don't trade because it's hard. Yeah, if you do, hard. don't use leverage. But get a job, earn money, and dollar cost average. Dollar cost average. And just, and then everyone gets told that, and then they go, yeah, but I'm going to trade this shit, <laughs> and I'm going to trade Dogecoin on leverage, and they get wrecked. And you know, maybe you lose them, or maybe they just, you know, they focus. But 2017, getting wrecked at early 18, great lesson. Yeah, great changed lesson. everything for me, and now I just don't worry about it. Welcome back to season five of Kryptonite's special edition London and Canary Wharf. We have some of the original gangsters of the crypto space and on top of that, a new format where you can earn crypto in every single show, plus earn swag and more. So don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and let's have some fun. Woo! <laughs> Some of the biggest banks are money laundering for the Sinaloa cartel. And so much of what we're doing is trying to provide more transparency to the financial world. We're going to see a surge in interest in smart contract platforms. It's going to be an interesting market. NFTs coming from everyone. Everyone's dropping NFTs. So anyone now today still not sure about Bitcoin? You're fucking mad. <laughs>'Cause of my back, which is still a problem. Uh, but no, it's great to see you. What a great setting, man. This is this is beautiful. It's romantic, so, right? It's just amazing. It's just like it's outdoors. It's a rare non what would you have done if it was raining? I know, that was a thing. Like I was crossing my fingers every night. Please don't rain. I guess you could have gone inside. Uh, look, it's a great setting, man. And look, it's great to great to do this. It's great to do this. And I remember just watching the Bitcoin conference in Miami. It was so funny. I saw you and Pomp going at each other, the second best podcast, the first best podcast. And, yeah. and by I the way, both, I, both of you guys, I love what you guys are doing. And one thing we're talking about humility and you know, a lot of people see you as that hardcore, rough, tough guy, but they, a lot of people don't know like all the struggles you've been through and, and all the tough times. It's not just about all glamorous lights and cool stuff, right? You've been through you've quite the story. Yeah, but like, I mean, everybody's got baggage. Everyone's had a, uh, a past. Uh, I've been really lucky with this job to travel the world and uh, anything I've put up with in life, uh, it doesn't compare to what other people have had to go through. I mean, I've, I've had a moderately middle-class life. Uh, never really had, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money, but uh, we, we weren't poor. Uh, I've had a relatively good adult life so to me it's just it's just my life dude it's just what i've lived and there's been some shit times but i mean everyone's had shit times i've always just been a hard worker uh i've never i've never been a high achiever at sports or academically but i've always worked hard so especially career wise i've always just i've always felt like i can beat people by working harder than and then so i've always done that I just had a, like this little period of time where everything went wrong. Like I, I got divorced after being, well, I separated after three months of marriage and, and then got divorced. Uh, uh, my mum died and I got quite a bad drug problem at the same time. So all that happened in a close amount of time. Amount of time and then yeah. my company collapsed and I lost all my money. So like that was a really oh, shit, shit period in time. But um, I actually look at it a different way. You can say it can make me stronger. I was like, I see it more like uh, that just set a new path career because my marriage ended and I was pissed off and upset so, and I stopped going to work and then my company collapsed uh, so that meant I wasn't working and then my mum got sick and that meant I needed Bitcoin for a certain reason and then when I was recovering from drugs 
I ended up going to a retreat where I met a guy who was a podcaster and started a podcast. So all that happened was like a chain of events meant yeah. I went through a series of things. That means I'm right here now with you. Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, if I hadn't gone to that retreat and met a podcast, I'd have found something else. And I, I, I think I would have done okay. And because I would have worked hard, mm. you know, if my mum hadn't died, I, I maybe wouldn't have got into Bitcoin or my marriage hadn't separated. I might still have my company in London. And I just feel really lucky that, that it's that chain of events that's led to this yeah. life because uh, so many great things are happening. I feel really fortunate. It's so true what you're saying because it did completely alternate your path, right? Because at yeah. that time you're saying, and I remember your story very well, Bitcoin was mainly used on the dark web, right? For buying yeah. drugs and some people, earlier some people were talking about people selling missiles, rocket launchers, some crazy shit going on the dark web. But do you think it, exactly that was the cause and effect of who you are today or? No, look, I, I mean, I was just working in advertising doing a lot of cocaine, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> and then one of my mates was like, oh, I've, there's this website you can you can buy drugs online. It's like Amazon. Uh, I was like, what? <laughs> so he came, he comes around my house. Amazon and he, drugs. Yeah, when he comes around my house, he's like, here it is. He's showing me. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, yeah. this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the best thing was, you could order the results based on ratings. So you, so I was like, straight to cocaine, best ratings. Right, that's the guy. How do we buy? It's like, oh, you need Bitcoin. I was like, what the fuck's Bitcoin? He's like this digital money that you can't be tracked with because at the time we didn't yeah. think. I was like, this is all amazing. So uh, I just ended up buying loads of drugs at that time and doing loads of drugs, uh, which all went real to shit because I ended up in uh, an ambulance where I had to like change course at that point. But uh, no, I just, I just think my life, like anyone's, is a series of events and you just like, just go in different directions. You've seen the film Sliding Doors, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, your life is a series of sliding doors and you end up where you end up. Yeah. I mean, I could, you know, I could easily have any of those things not happen and just be somewhere else doing something different. And this is the one where I've ended up with and I quite like it. <laughs> I want to keep it, not fuck it up. It's funny because most of my friends now in London, they use Monero to buy drugs, by the way. <laughs> so uh, I know. Well, I don't, do, I don't do drugs anymore. I had to stop that when I... When it went bad. Good initiative, good initiative. But I must ask, like, re with regards to dark web and in Bitcoin Miami, Miami, the conference, you know, as you know, there was a very emotional video yeah. about the creator. Ross who's, Obert. Yeah, gone to jail, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like, I've been reading online, like, there are really two sides to the story. You know, some people say, listen, you know, you fucked up the first impression of Bitcoin, you know you never get a second chance to create a first impression. So the dark web, you know, the Well, they're clearly thing. wrong because look at Bitcoin now. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. fuck those guys. But you know, it's like how some of the traditional guys like, oh, this is just used for drugs, drug money and all that kind of stuff. So some people are kind of like, oh, but this dark web stained the reputation of Bitcoin. And then the other guy's like, no, man, he was just trying to create a free marketplace for people not to be condemned by governments. What is your overall take on this? So do, you, do you feel like we should try to free this person? It was a bit too harsh in the way he was treated and imprisoned and stuff like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, you, I don't know if you know this, my 10th interview was with Lynn, his mother. Oh. And I've interviewed her four times, I think now. I've got to know her quite well. Uh, me and Ross have written to each other. Um, uh, he thanked me for the support. Uh, I've checked in on him and seen his talk i was sat with lid well a couple of seats down from her when uh, they played this thing it was, it was very sad it was quite depressing really to listen to because it it wasn't a story about bitcoin this is a story about this guy who essentially is it's like a it's like a death sentence but the slowest death sentence in the world no. like it's a natural death sentence whereby he just has to waste away in jail uh, and it's ridiculous i mean if he'd have Accepted his accepted his plea bargain. He he might be out now, uh, and he's a smart young man. I think Novogratz said it like, no, no service. No, no, nobody in society has been served by keeping this man in jail. It's not violent. He created a website for liberty to allow people to get around uh, arbitrary uh, rules that don't work. So the best way to look at it is, the Silk Road was a startup, and successful startups solve a problem. What did the problem he solve? People were going to take drugs. Nobody goes, do you know what? I'm not gonna get high tonight because I don't wanna get caught by the police. No one fucking thinks that. Yeah. People wanna get high, they do it, and hope they don't get caught. Some people sell. They really don't wanna get caught because they might end up in jail for like 10 years. But the, the, the war on drugs has failed. And also the war on drugs has made uh, drug consumption and purchase more dangerous because 
certainly in other countries, <laughs> you know, a lot of people get killed through the drugs trade. Less so here, but also you have to go meet somebody in like a dark alley or behind a Sainsbury's and you don't know the quality of the product you're going to get. But the Silk Road changed that. There was, you didn't need to meet people. So it reduced the violence there and you could uh, uh, review the dealers. So it improved the quality of the product and there was support forums to support people. So it solved a problem that uh, the state has failed with. And uh, it was wildly successful because of that. And if you go onto the Drug Policy Alliance's website, they actually say it, it reduced harm and it reduced violence. But the state has rules and he broke the rules and he had to go to jail. But listen, look, I asked his mum about this. I said, you know, he did break the rules. Yeah. Do you think he should have gone to jail? And she said, I think time served now is enough of a punishment. Mm. And I agree. I think most people agree. So I support Ross, but I'm also a big supporter of anyone who is in jail for certainly non-violent crimes. Certainly, like, marijuana is now either legal or decriminalized in like, most states in the US, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Society has not collapsed. The product's improved. And there are tax receipts. Everyone has benefited from that. So we've proven that that prohibition of marijuana was was ridiculous. People looking at mar uh, sorry, looking at mushrooms now, and also you've got uh, PTSD treatment with MDMA. Okay, so the world is changing, yet there are people people still in jail for marijuana. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think Ross will be freed one day. I worry how long that will be, but I'm sure a president one day will realize. The, the, the waste of life and cost of keeping people in jail for nonviolent crimes, certainly those related to drugs. That makes a lot of sense. And do you think so with the support of the community, we can accelerate the freedom of, of Ross or? Look, there's a number of great people working it already. Uh, they lobbied hard with Trump. Trump felt like a good guy for this because he wanted prison reform. Uh, he tried to enact some prison reform. He did, uh, he did pardon Alice Johnson, I think her name is, mm. who, uh, spent years in jail for a, quite a minor drug crime. Like, so I, I don't hold a lot of confidence with Biden, but you know, look at the change in politics now. You know, Bukele in El Salvador is an advertisement to what a politician can do. Like, I'm not saying he's perfect, but he is an advertisement of what you can do politics. You've got Lummis in, uh, Cynthia Lummis in Wyoming who cares about Bitcoin. Uh, I doubt there's many politicians these days who well, kids growing up these days who may become politicians will probably look back at these uh, laws and look at these people in jail and just think, this is ridiculous. Yeah, We need to move on from this kind of torture of people. Because it is torture. It's a bit like Julian Assange. Yeah, You know, he's in jail as a journalist. So, you know, I, I think hopefully we're going to move on from these kind of things being deemed crimes. You know, obviously, so the dark web and, you know, being able to buy drugs was kind of like the first like awareness part for you. Were there any other further steps down the line where you thought another light bulb, you that, know? That wasn't a light bulb for Bitcoin with oh, the dark, okay. dark web. That was just, that was a light bulb for good cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was. I, was, I, know I feel bad saying it. Like, I, don't, I don't do drugs anymore, but at the time, this is like, this yeah. is fucking great. And then I, you know, stopped doing drugs and forgot about it, forgot about Bitcoin. Uh, and then I had to uh, I discover it again when my mum was dying because we wanted to get a cannabis oil. Oh yeah, the cannabis yeah. oil story, right? But even, but even yeah. then, even then, it wasn't like a light bulb. All that happened was I was out of work because yeah. my company had collapsed. My mum died, and I had a bit of this Bitcoin left, so I went to sell it on Coinbase. And uh, there was this other thing, Ethereum. I was like, oh, what's that? So I googled it, and I came across like an article, something like a the blockchain revolution, which, by the way, I think is bullshit now. Sorry, audience, but. Uh, and I was like, okay, what's this? I was like, well, I had some money left over. I was like, okay, I'll buy some Ethereum and I bought some Bitcoin and every other shitcoin I could. And, and and there was still no real light bulb moment. It was just more like things were saying, this is the next internet. If you miss the internet, you've got the blockchain revolution. I was like, well, I, I need something. So I put some money in and it wasn't until I started the podcast that I really started to spend time trying to deeply understand Bitcoin. Because up until then, I was just trying to trade it. And I was just trying to make money. Uh, and then I started the podcast. I started talking to all these smart people. I really started to understand Bitcoin, why it matters, why it's, to me, the most important technology in the world right now. 
was that the purpose of the podcast in the beginning? You just wanted to understand this and educate people at the same time? No, again, I don't have any like really <laughs> profound like things like, <laughs> like this. They, no, they're, they're all like w weird coincidences. What it was uh. is I went vegan because my mum did when she was dying. She went vegan, so I did it with her. And I was listening to this guy's podcast called Rich Roll. He's a vegan ultra athlete. And I Googled him and it turned out he was doing an event in Italy with his wife. It was a vegan yoga and running retreat. I was like, wow, I'll fucking go to that. that so sounds healthy. I phoned them, well, yeah, I phoned them up and they said, oh, we got one place left. I'm like, done. So I went and I, I was hanging out with him. I was just like, you're really cool and your life's really cool. So I said to him, like at the end, he was like to everyone, yeah, and I stay in touch. If you're ever in LA, look me up. So I get back to England. I'm like, I'm just fucking going. I want to go and hang out with you. So I booked a flight to LA. I was like, hi, I'm here. And then uh, I was just like, uh, I think your life's really cool. Uh, I, I want the same. I, how do you become a podcaster? And he said, well, this is the equipment you need and you need a subject and you watch this Pat Flynn course and you got to just stick with it. And so I was like, all right, I'll do a Bitcoin one. And it was just a hobby. Uh, and Bitcoin was, the price was high, so I'd made some money. So I was just flying around just enjoying the lifestyle. The podcast wasn't doing that well. I was just enjoying the lifestyle. And it was when I did the Lynn interview, mm. which was like interview 10. So I did the first one, November 17. I bought a film camera and filmed that one actually. And then when she left, I was like, wow, that was powerful. I want to take this seriously. Oh, really? But that was more like, I was like, I kind of think I want to be a journalist. Uh, uh. And I want to take this seriously. So I did. And then but do you what, remember specifically what she told you that really moved you at that time? It was the whole story. It's just the whole this, is, story. this is someone's life. I enjoyed doing the interview. I wanted to be a better interviewer. Like I wanted to I wanted to do a really good job of it. And I was like, I, I need to make this work because I think if I can make this work, this is this will be my final job, right? I'm not if I can make this a career, yeah. I can do this until I stop and so I was like, I've got to make this, I've got to make this work. So then it's like, right, how do I make this a career? But I just focus on the podcast. You know, then when I got my first check, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is business. Now I can now. monetize. Yeah, it's business. This, this is, so how much do I need to get to make it? Actually, I can afford to do this. Yeah. And, and then here we are now. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So when you, you met Lynn, you had that kind of breakthrough. Oh, it was kind of a casual thing at first, yeah. a hobby, but then all of a sudden switch okay, now I want to make this my profession. Yep. Were there any other specific interviews? I mean, obviously it's hard to, people when they ask me that question, it's hard for me to answer it as well, but were there any other interviews that you remember that you just thought, fuck. Yeah, the it. president of El Salvador. Oh yeah, can we keep that to the end? Can we keep that to the end? Yeah, but it, honestly. Really, that, it blew your mind? Yeah, I mean, the, the do you need to ask? Yeah. Like, oh my God. <laughs> With I your Metallica we'll, t-shirt. We'll, well, we'll come back to that. Oh yeah, Any please. other ones? Oh God, it's such a good question. The problem is, is the last 18 months we've been in lockdown, it's been a different job. It's been a production, like a, pr a production line. And trying to do your best. Have you done remote interviews? I tried, but I suck at it. Yeah, I, the, the, I can't do everyone it. Everyone does, it sucks. It sucks. It's, it's, you don't have this, like yeah. full peripheral vision. So you interrupt each other. You don't have that 10 minutes hanging out beforehand, get the feel of each other. Yeah. You lose that personal touch and yeah. it's, it sucks. So I really struggle through the last 18 months to go, oh, this changed my life. This, is, this, this interview meant a lot. It, just, it was just a business and a production. I did my best. But so I have to go before then and I have to think about interviews I did previously and did in person. One stood out, but it wasn't for this podcast. I had this other one, Defiance, uh, and I went out to Taiwan and I interviewed the most senior defector from North Korea. That, the difference with that one, it was the Lin one felt important because the story is important. That one felt important because I was like, I, this is a credible interview. Mm. Like I've got an interview with a, like a highly credible international figure. And I was like, I want to do more of that. I like that. I want to, I want to do more of that. So that really stood out to me, but it's hard to remember. There's been so many. Yeah, man. there's it's so like, many epic interviews, right? Eric Voorhees, Andreas Antonopoulos. You've yeah. had so many legends. It's definitely getting weird. <laughs> it's getting really weird, mate. Honestly, some of the shit I could tell you, it's just getting weird. We actually didn't manage to find yet that specific moment where you thought, oh, Bitcoin is the most beautiful piece of technology. I mean, firstly, it's so simple. It's 
basically a ledger yeah. that keeps a record of who's got what. That's basically all it is. The beauty of it is like everything else has so many rules about who can do the bank. You can only use it this time of day. Or if you send a payment, you get it at this time. Like yeah. there's so many different rules. No, you can't do this. Like we live in a world where we've got the government just, they just create more and more fucking rules. They get bigger and bigger and more rules. And then suddenly there is this thing that they can't do fuck all about. You know, if I want to send you some Bitcoin, you get it. And if I want to send it to a guy in, in Iran, yeah. I can do it. And if I want to send it to someone, if someone in Iran wants to send something to someone in the US and they send that to North Korea, nobody can stop them. No, and that is, that is beautiful because that opens up so many possibilities. And I'm going to steal something here from Peter Van Valkenburg. For every transaction we don't like, there's a transaction we can celebrate. You know, that may be somebody sending Bitcoin to a protester in Nigeria protesting against the uh, uh, protest for the NSARS movement, the their military police who are basically torturing and killing people, or people in Belarus who are uh, demonstrating against Lukashenko, who is a dictator, right? Every one of those is a positive thing because it's a free, open, permissionless network that can get money to people who need it in corrupt situations or under authoritarian regimes because they're just fucking broke or poor. They've got no access to the banking system. That's a beautiful thing. But also, its beauty is it's just its simplicity. Like you can really, I know your show is a crypto show and I'm like Bitcoin and everything else is shit. But, <laughs> but everything else is also so complicated. Mm. Like Ethereum to me is so complicated. Bitcoin's so simple. It's just a ledger. And it has to do a couple of things really well. One is it has to be as maximally decentralized as possible, which it does a pretty good job of. And it has to do that to be uh, to maintain censorship resistance. And secondly, it has to enforce the 21 million hard cap. All, everything else is a bonus. Everything else is scope creep. It, if it can do those two things, it means we don't have currency debasement with it, and anyone can send it to anyone. It's just beautifully simple, but what do you get off the back of that? You get people able to send money to people they need. You get a country able to defend itself against the US dollar in El Salvador. You get companies able to protect themselves against currency debasement, as well as individuals. You get people who are able to save. And then on top of this, Bitcoin does change your mindset. Yeah. So people listening to you or watching your show, they might not be into Bitcoin, but I, I'm telling you, everyone I know has gone into it. They, they've shifted their life. They've chi shifted their attitude to family, food, exercise, consumption. And it's just a beautiful thing. And all it is, is it's just a ledger. It's incredible. It's incredible. And it's a ledger that can genuinely, or well, not gen can gen, it is genuinely changing the world. And again, I know it sounds hyperbolic, but it just is. No, I hear you. Like for me, the biggest like aha moment was my dad lives in Iran, in Tehran, and obviously it's a sanctioned country. And, and I think people don't realize how bad a sanctioned so country Visa, really Mastercard, is. So Visa, Mastercard, but not part of the SWIFT network. It's like no banking account. They lose their job because they're exporting oil. You know, it really, it's the the shittiest of all situations to be in a sanctioned country. The, the, politi the political bull crap really affects, as you know, the lives of all human beings and when I it, my only alternative was to send Bitcoin to my dad for him to then you know cash out in in real and in, in the actual Let that was the only way to do it <laughs> you know these fuckers Paul Crookman Peter Schiff Nuro Rubini, Steve Hankey is it Hankey uh who's the other one Nassim Taleb all yeah. these motherfuckers sorry do, is it okay to swear yeah, yeah please go all for these, it <laughs> and all these fuckers are on Twitter always like deriding Bitcoin and listen, I think you can criticize volatility. And I know we've got an excuse for everything, but you you know, we can excuse volatility, but we have to accept that makes it a difficult savings technology or a medium of exchange for certain people. I accept that. You can criticize that. But when you say Bitcoin has failed, or you say Bitcoin has no use case, you're either lying or intellectually dishonest. I even tweeted out, I said, okay, and I tagged them all, I said, if Bitcoin has no use case, can you tell me how you can send remittance from any country in the world to any other country in the world, instant and near free. Just tell me how you can do that. Please tell me. Honestly, if you can tell me, I'm with you. And if I want to get money to a protester in Nigeria, how can I do that when they're switched off from the banking system? Just tell me how I can do that. And you can't. And anyone says you can, 
I mean, you, only, you can say I could do it with Ethereum because it's another crypto, right? But strictly speaking, if you just say, if you use Bitcoin as the, the, as the kingpin for crypto, there's nothing that can do it better, cheaper or faster. And there's liquidity in every country in the world. So those people, what they're actually fighting against is human freedom because yeah. these use cases are remittance puts more money in the hands of the people who need it. And remittance is usually people sending money to friends and family who are poorer. That's what remittance is for. It's people in El Salvador and at US send it to their family in El Salvador because they need money for food or living. And you know, remittance companies takes a bunch of that. So that that improves humanity. Okay. It, it banks people who cannot get bank accounts. 70% again, El Salvador, 70% of the people are, are, don't have a bank account. Mm. It banks these people, right? And it helps support protesters. These are all human freedom issues. Anyone says doesn't have a use case, you're a fucking liar and you're working against human freedom. And honestly, it's, it's, I think it's actually a disgrace to do that. Mm. So it pisses me off, sorry. No, but I love Started it, I fun. love it. No, 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 ah. I, I resonate with that 100 <laughs> yeah. million percent, man. I love that you share that openly again. You know, you're you're a guy who's no has no filter, which is which is what, what makes it even more exciting, right? All it's the one filter of my makes it boring. <laughs> and when you're not that smart, just swear a lot. <laughs> fuck this, fuck that. <laughs> no, but it's so true. And so, in terms of the definition of Bitcoin, you know, like uh, I had an interview with Eric Bouris came on our show, and this is so who? funny, Eric Eric Bouris. Eric Voorhees. Voorhees, yeah. yeah. You're saying that almost French. Oh, yeah, Voorhees. yeah. No, actually, I'm, I'm French, actually. Ah, <laughs> so American you're fr French. You're American, French, Iranian, and living in London. Yeah. Dude. It's a very complicated Jesus. cocktail, right? Yeah. <laughs> and Eric was, was telling me when I asked him, it's like, super silly question, but what is Bitcoin? What's the definition of Bitcoin? And Eric told me, actually... It's a hard question. It's a hard question because it's evolved so much over time. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's also... It's quite individual. Yeah, it's quite individual. Like, what do you say it is? Well, to me, it's really hard. I actually, I, I don't know. It depends who you're telling as well, because Bitcoin, there's the protocol and there's the asset. Yeah, and yeah. But if you explain what the protocol is, it is a open monetary network. Yeah. Uh, I was just sat uh, an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, with John Pfeffer uh, down in West London. And he was telling me how uh, Vince has explained it to him. And he said, basically money is a ledger and Bitcoin is the best monetary ledger in the world. And I guess why it's the best is that it allows you to send money to anyone anywhere in the world instantly, and there's a fixed limit. Those same two points mm. I keep bringing up. If I'm given an interview like this, I would say it's it's a open, free monetary network that anyone in the world can use at any point, and anyone can connect to it. But if, you, if it's my friend in a pub, and they're like, Pete, What's Bitcoin? I don't want to say it's an open monetary network. I don't, go, I don't <laughs> what give a fuck. fuck is that? Yeah, what the fuck are you on about? Same Internet them, money, maybe? No. I just say it's money. It's just money. Bitcoin is money. But I'm talking about the asset then. Yeah. Bitcoin is money, and it's the best form of money that's ever existed. And that's all that's I have to all say. Because then say. they're like, why is it the best? Yeah, why is it the best? And then you can go, well, let's talk about the money printer. Let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about fiat the, cycles. Yeah, let's talk about the bank. The bank. Uh, your money being an IOU. Let's talk about it. only £85,000 is insured in the banks. Yeah. Let's talk about the fact that you can't spend your money what you want all the time. Let's talk about how long transactions take. Let's talk about the fact that banks track every payment you make now because they run surveillance for the government, yeah. which is fact. Let's talk about all these things. And then let's talk about Bitcoin and say, well, Bitcoin solves all those problems. You know? It can't be debased. It's just the same point. Yeah. You can't send anywhere. So you keep coming back to the same points. And that's my approach is keep it simple. So yes, me, for the world, Bitcoin is an open monetary network that anyone can use and stores a very honest, fair ledger. And to my friends, it's the best money that's ever existed. And that's keep so it good because you open it up, you kind of bait them to ask you for more questions, right? Yeah. It's like the pro what? Yeah. The best money? That's a bold statement. Best money that ever existed. <laughs> It's the Liverpool of money. <laughs> and speaking of which, guys watching out there, if you want to earn a free BTC airdrop or some BTC swag, put your opinion below. What is your definition for Bitcoin? There's so many out there. And tell us why you think it's the best definition. And we'll get back to you with the prize of the week. So question for you, Peter. So you were mentioning like Ethereum is too complicated. And, you know, obviously you've had some cool discussions about, you know, maximalism, toxicity recently on Twitter. It's mm -hmm. a bit of a a tribalistic warfare sometimes out there. Um, is that the reason why, are you still a Bitcoin maxi first, but, and also like, is that why you think 
other projects are not as interesting, it's because it's too complicated, it's not as simple to understand. Is, are no. there some of the, the key points? It's a, it's a good question, and it's not a simple answer.